as Peg has declared, uh, God has, has invited us to come to him for the bread of life and for the, the living waters. And the Bible's image of us as sheep is so multifaceted. And we, we need the Lord for sustenance. And then as his sheep, we're led by the shepherd in all these different directions. Uh, now, he loves us, but sometimes what's going on to us as sheep is ponderous, perplexing. We don't know what's going on. Um, now, we've got a really, really, really dramatic example of that for sheep in that whole picture that I put up there for the kids. I mean, if I'm a sheep and then all of a sudden I'm told, okay, now carry this kid on my back, I'm not sure I'm going to be happy about that as a sheep, right? I mean, that's crazy. Now, as we traveled out west, I had never been to a professional rodeo before. Maybe some of you had. I had not. And I was not familiar with with a lot of what was going on. I definitely was not familiar with this idea of mutton busting. And that's what this is called. Mutton busting. And I don't know who came up with this, but I'm pretty sure it was probably not the kids sitting around saying, you know what, what I'd really like to be when I grow up? I'd like to be a mutton buster. I'd like to ride sheep. You know, no kid ever is going to say that to his or her friends, right? No, this, I'm pretty sure whoever came up with this, this was Billy Bob and Jimbo after a couple of brewskis out on the range saying, you know what would be funny? (laughs) Let's get little Sally and put her on a sheep. Right? I mean, that's, that's crazy that this would come. But nonetheless, these kids... I mean, you want to talk about courageous. I mean, the sheep are bigger than them. And, and if you haven't been around sheep, like, you know, they, they bounce. Like, they can really jump, right? And so you put this little kid on the back of his sheep, and it's bouncing all around. And the idea is that the kid's got to stay on the sheep. And some of these kids, man, they were courageous. They were like, well, that sheep might stomp me, but I'm going to jump on the back of it. I'm going to hold on. And the winner got a trophy that was taller than he was. I mean, it was really cool. I was like, Wow. That's courageous. But for me to get on the back of a sheep would not take a whole lot of courage, right? <laughs> you know, because I'm bigger than the sheep. I know what it's going to do. I can wrangle it down. That wouldn't be courageous. But if, if you're doing something that is scary for you, that's intimidating, where you might even get hurt, and you know that, and you're, that, that does terrify you, that's courageous. Now, I wanted to start thinking about f- with you all, what would take courage for you to do and is God putting something on your heart and mind, maybe on your mouth to say, something to do that's going to take some courage? You know, you're going to have to say something that may be tough, or you're going to have to do something that may be tough, or, or other people may not like it, or it, it may somehow get you in trouble, but you know it's the right thing to do. For you, there's probably something that's going to take courage. And it may surprise other people that it's a little difficult for you. You know, we talked about heights. For some people, that's no big deal. I'll go up high on the heights there, and it's not going to be scary. For others of us, it's big. I've seen instances where coming back from war, soldiers got so accustomed to the stresses of being in that environment that it's actually more stressful for them to come back and then have to have a tea party with their daughter and to go to a nine-to-five. And there have been studies I was reading just recently, the cortisol levels that cause stress for some special ops uh, officers and and soldiers, for them, they get less cortisol released when they go into battle because they're comfortable. They've been trained for this. They know what they're doing. But you send them home, and all of a sudden, they got to do some dishes, do the 9 to 5, and have the tea party with their daughter, and they don't know what to do. They, They get stressed. So for them, courage may look different it may be spending time with that kid or doing that routine thing that you just aren't excited to do but you got to do it and it's somehow so for you courage may look differently it may be forgiving somebody or saying something that needs to be done or said but man it's for you it's just kind of terrifying when we get into the scripture we're going to see the apostle paul in a setting that is probably not going to be exactly you or me ever we're probably not going to be in a worshiping environment where the worshipers try to kill us. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's probably not going to happen. However, in his situation, it just about happens. And he has to decide, am I going to still speak the truth? And am I still going to live the truth? Or am I going to kind of back away, go back to the status quo, and be safe? So we've been talking about the book of Acts. And I'm going to turn in the book of Acts 
to Acts 21, 22, 23. So, you know, chapters a little later in the book of Acts. Um, and I'm, we're going to read some substantial portions of that. But to give you the background, just to remember, Paul was raised in a very strictly conservative Jewish household where you followed all of the laws of the Old Testament as interpreted by the people of that day. It's 2,000 years ago in Israel. Um, and in that whole setting there, he is now, he's had this dramatic conversion. He went around putting people that followed the way of Jesus into jail because those people were saying Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. There were other Jews like Paul that said, no, he's not. You're blaspheming and that by the Old Testament law, you ought to be killed or at the very least in prison. And so he was doing that. But then he had this encounter with the resurrected Jesus where Jesus appeared to him and spoke to him and, and he had this dramatic conversion. And so then he started then telling other people first Jews and then non-Jews, the Gentiles, he started saying, Jesus is real. He's really the Messiah. And some of the people got excited and were happy about that, but there were others that were still that hard line Jewish conservative background that were like, no, he's not the Messiah. The, the Romans still are in power. They're still ruling over us. No, the Messiah would not have still allowed that to happen. And so as we get into Acts chapter 21, Paul has decided after being a missionary out to the Gentile nations, traveling to different parts of Greece, all around the Mediterranean region, he decides, I'm going to go back to the roots of our faith, back to Jerusalem, where the temple is, so that I can worship as my ancestors did, as my Jewish you know, family did, as I did as a boy and then as an adult. I'm going to go and worship at the appointed time that the Old Testament said, go worship at the temple. I'm going to do that to show the Jews that I respect our tradition, but I believe Jesus has reinterpreted it, that the Messiah has the power and the right to kind of redo that which we've been trying to do. So he goes back to Jerusalem. But this is risky because the people that knew him as the guy that would put Christians in the prison are still there and they're still in power. So when he goes back to Jerusalem, this is dangerous because they see him as a blasphemer. And so I'm going to start reading at verse 26 where it says, Then the next day Paul took the men who were with him, who had been traveling around as, as missionaries as well, he took them, having purified himself along with them, and entered the temple, announcing the completion of the purification days when the offering for each of them would be made. As the seven days were about to end, now this is following strict Old Testament law, right? He's showing, I do respect it, and so did my, my, my fellow disciples here. As those days were about to end, the Jews from Asia saw him in the temple complex, stirred up the whole crowd, and seized him, shouting, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and against our law and against this place. What's more, he has also brought Greeks into the temple and has profaned this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with him. And they assumed, they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple complex. The whole city was stirred up, and the people rushed together, and they seized Paul, and they dragged him out of the temple complex, and at once the gates were shut. As they were trying to kill him, word went up to the commander of the regiment that all of Jerusalem was in chaos. Now this is the, the Gentile, Roman, secular government leader in that area, kind of like the police chief, right, the commander. So he finds out, man, at this holy temple where they're worshiping God, they're about to kill a guy. What's going on? So he sends his police force in. Taking along soldiers and centurions, he immediately ran down to them. Seeing the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. <laughs> they're literally beating Paul, right? They've dragged him outside of the temple gates, and they're beating him, about to kill him. Then the commander came up, he took him into custody, and he ordered him to be bound with two chains. He asked him who he was and what he had done. Some in the mob were shouting one thing and some another, and since he was not able to get reliable information because of the uproar, he ordered Paul to be taken to the barracks. When Paul got up the steps, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the mob's violence, for the mass of people followed yelling, Take him away! As he was about to be brought into the barracks, Paul said to the commander, Am I allowed to say something? 
he replied, Do you know Greek? Aren't you the Egyptian who raised a rebellion some time ago and led 4,000 assassins into the wilderness? And Paul's like, no, <laughs> right? He says, no, I'm a Jewish man from Tarsus of Cilicia, a citizen of an important city. Now I ask you, let me speak to the people. After he had been given permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned with his hand to the people. When there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language. And then he goes into a speech, okay? So now let's, let's make sure that you've got the picture of what's going on, all right? I'm going to let you all be the crowd of temple worshipers. So you're all Jewish, and you're all uh, passionate about the Old Testament, and you're, you're worshiping at the temple. I'm Paul, which means that you get to be murderously mad with me. Two thumbs up, right? Yeah, yes, I'm going to be, no, no, but you've got to pretend. You've got to pretend. Too many smiles out there right now, right? You've got to pretend you're murderously mad, right? So we're in the temple. Giant high columns. There is um, the smell of incense that burns. There is there are burnt offerings. There are things that are cooked. There are things that are poured. Um, there are animals all around. Now you you, you understand what this is going to smell like, right? I mean, this is a mess of smells. All kinds of crazy sounds. You know, it's the sounds of animals getting slaughtered. The sounds of people praising God and singing, the sounds of, of, uh, of just, I mean, just kind of chaotic kind of worship, and yet everything's going on there. I, Paul, come in, and you see me, and a group of you knows me from the past, you know, and you knew that I used to be one of you, but now I'm not anymore, right? I'm a Christian, and you're still mad at me for that, and there are others that are just going to go along with the crowd, right? You know, if the crowd goes crazy, we're going to go crazy because you know that's how mobs work, right? Not everybody's thinking clearly. You know, they just kind of start doing what the crowd does. And so now imagine, now you guys are yelling for me to be killed. Now let's practice that. Kill him! you got to yell that, right? One, two, three. <laughs> now I know you're kidding, but that's intimidating. Just that, right? That's crazy. If... The Columbus Dispatch got word that at Columbia Heights, we took one of us, took him outside of the church with a bunch of rocks, right, and started beating on the guy. Like, you know what that's going to do, right? That's going to be front page, above the fold news, right? I mean, that's going to be, I mean, that's going to hit, that's going to hit the internet, it's going to hit TV. Like, that's crazy, but that's what's going on. They drag him out. They're that mad at him. So just pick one of the people in here and just assume we got so mad at them we took them outside and we started beating them trying to kill them and the secular police department had to show up and say look man this is crazy we don't even believe in your god but this is crazy and so they arrest paul now paul then and chains he says hey can i address the crowd right i mean okay so if you're going to address the crowd the police chief is probably like well I'll let you because I assume you're going to say, hey, my bad. I'm sorry. You know, this is a misunderstanding. You know, I mean, the, the police guy is probably thinking that. But Paul starts speaking in Hebrew. Now, at that point, they realize Paul has spoken probably in their common language Aramaic. He's spoken to the commander in Greek. Now he's speaking Hebrew. That makes him one of the most educated people in the place. So the common people are like, who is this guy? Like, where'd he get this education, right? And those that knew him from the past are probably thinking, well, maybe he's going to make good and make right and say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, Jesus is not the Messiah, right? So they're going to give him one more chance. And this is his one more chance. From here on out in the book of Acts, he's arrested under the Roman government and he's being shipped around to the, to the secular leaders and stuff. This is his one final shot to speak to the Jews at the temple, right? He doesn't say, I'm sorry. <laughs> he doesn't, right? He doesn't. I mean, when you look at, at what he says, he gives his testimony. And so his second, or his, his speech to the people then, as you read from verse uh, 40 of chapter 21, throughout chapter 22, his speech to the people in chains is his testimony. He talks about how he was struck blind as he was going to imprison Christians he was struck blind by Jesus, and then he had to go to a follower of Jesus named Ananias, who then prayed for him, and he got his sight back. So he has encountered Jesus. He heard Jesus' voice. 
he goes to a follower of Jesus and receives his sight back. He's convinced Jesus is real. <laughs> Done deal. I was wrong. Jesus is real. He's really risen from the dead. I've got to follow Jesus. So he gives them that testimony. Now, <laughs> the crowd, you, you know the reaction, right? So he's in chains. He's like, oh, by the way, I was struck blind by Jesus, and then I received my sight back by the prayer of a Jesus-following Christian. The crowd's not happy with that. They're like, no, baloney, right? And so they get really mad at him at this point, you know? And so, but, but Paul is just like, look, this is what happened to me. And furthermore, <laughs> and this makes the, the people really mad, he says, furthermore, Jesus told me, the Jewish people aren't going to believe you. You got to go to the Gentiles. And at that point, that like the crowd erupts, right? They are absolutely, absolutely mad. So in chapter 22, verse 22, easy to remember, 2222. Two, two, two. You can look it up in your Bible or on your phone. It, they raised their voices saying, wipe this person off the earth. It's a disgrace for him to live. That kind of rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Wipe this person off the earth. It's a disgrace for him to live. Go ahead and say that about me. I'm Paul. Wipe this person off the earth. It's a disgrace for him to live. The church folk are saying that about Paul, right? That's what's going on. Now, at that point, secular police commander is like, this is bad. <laughs> this is really bad. Like, I don't understand all that's going on. I'm not sure what's going on. But these religious folks that are at the temple there to worship are really mad at this guy. First they were trying to kill him. Now they're saying, we got to just wipe him off the earth. It's a disgrace. So at this point, we then transition to yet another speech. Because now the, the police commander, who's a pretty amazing guy in this story, he's like, okay, let's separate off the religious leaders from the crazy crowd. Let's get the crazy crowd out. Let's get the religious leaders together, okay? Religious leaders. Um, and so religious leaders, you know what I should do. Um, hey, Brother John, all right? We'll let you be the high priest. Do you mind standing up just for a second? All right? All right? It's the most high priestly looking guy in here, right? It's exactly right. I love it. I love it. So John, as the high priest, Paul is going to get to be presented to the high priest, and to the other religious leaders called the Sanhedrin, okay? Now, I need some Sanhedrin, so I'm going to invite, uh, I mean, Ed, would you mind just kind of standing up just kind of where you are? Jim, would you stand up? Or, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, Jim, yeah, just go ahead, yeah, all right? Just stay, just stay where you are. Now, notice I picked only men, right? Because women can't be leaders, amen? No, oh, yeah, I know, the guys are looking at me like, dude, you did not just say that. Old Testament times, only the men got to be the leaders, right? Paul was the one who said, in Christ, there is no male or female. How'd that go over with the men leaders who said, not in my book, not in my Old Testament. That's not what it says. You got to pick men among you that are going to be the leaders. Uh-uh-uh-uh. So you guys are looking at me, uh-uh-uh-uh. I'm mad at Paul, right? Now, I know you guys believe in women, you know, right? Uh, you know, I, know, I know personally. So I'm, I'm Paul. I'm before the Sanhedrin, okay? Now imagine these two guys right here, the pair of gems, they see eye to eye. They're Sadducees, okay? The Sadducees don't believe there's a resurrection of the dead. They don't believe in angels, okay? I'm not saying they personally do. This is in the Bible times, right? Sadducees, okay? The Pharisees, which Paul was a Pharisee, are trained to believe in the resurrection of the dead and to believe in angels, the Pharisees' theology actually is what carries in through the New Testament. Very interesting. It's more similar to what Paul taught. Okay? And so, so at this point, as Paul is brought before the leaders, and we're just about done with this part, as he's brought before the leaders, he looks at them and he's like, Sadducees, Pharisees. Hey, hey Pharisees, I'm on trial because I believe in the resurrection of the dead. <laughs> These two guys give me a thumbs up. <laughs> These two guys are like, we still want to kill you, right? But what goes on is now they start arguing with each other, right? So, I mean, they, they start going, well, you know, the Pharisees are like, well, we're good with this guy. We're good with this guy. Yeah, well, let's take those Pharisees down. And the Pharisees start getting mad. Now, this is like the most dysfunctional board meeting or church council you're ever going to find, right? Because we're talking about a guy's life. We're not just talking about the color of the carpet or something. We're talking about should Paul be stoned to death? And the Pharisees at this point are like, yep. 
Let's stone him. And the Pharisees are like, well, maybe not, maybe not. All right, guys, thanks a lot. Would you guys give them a hand? Because I mean, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Oh, sure, you clap for them and you tell me to be wiped off the face of the earth, right? I mean, that's crazy. But that's what's happening in this whole setting. And up in the screens, you see Paul being brought before the high priest who's sitting up there. And he's got the big beard. And he's got the funky hat and, and probably a phylactery on, which is like you know words of the Old Testament put in a little box. He may have straps around his arm because it says in the Bible to write it on your arm, right? So they, but you can't tattoo it. You can't have the tattoos, but yeah, you can, you, you've got to write it on your arm. How do you do that? You put it on straps of leather and you wrap it around your arm. So they are taking this law seriously. And Paul is saying, you don't have to sacrifice animals anymore. Jesus was the sacrifice. And in Christ, there's no male or female. There's not even Jew or Greek. We're all one together as the family of God by the Holy Spirit who comes upon you if you believe, regardless of whether you're male, female, or what race you are. Now for us, we're like, yeah, Paul, get it. But for the, the religious elite at the time, they're like, no. Not, it's not what it says here. It's not what it says here. I just don't agree with it. And Paul's like, well, yeah, it says that here and that here. But it also says this here and this here. Jesus says, for this time, emphasize these other things. And it is conflict. And Paul has two different opportunities to ease things and to go with the status quo and to say, hey, let's just be separate but equal. Let's be fine. You know, I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. I'll be quiet. My bad. I'll stay over in Greece. I won't come back to Israel. But he doesn't do any of that. He could say, nah, well, maybe Jesus isn't the Messiah. Maybe not. But he doesn't. He says, no, Jesus is the Messiah. I've encountered him. He's real. You guys have got to believe me. He says it to the crowd. Then he says it to the religious leaders and the elite. The religious leaders, the elite, then, still are not happy with him. And in the process of all of this, we read in verse 11 of chapter 23. So Acts 23, 11 we read that Jesus himself appears to Paul again to say, have courage. For as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Okay? Now, this is interesting because I think many times this is the way God works. It's like God says, I'm going to give you encouragement, but you're still going to have to work through something tough. This is exactly what he does with Paul. Paul gets the exciting revelation to encounter Jesus in some direct way once again. I'm so envious of Paul on that point. I wish I could see Jesus like that. I wish I could experience Jesus like that. But what goes along with that experience is a challenge greater than anything I've ever faced. Because he is told, look, you were just my witness in Jerusalem, and it just about got you killed, and it did get you beaten. And you're still under arrest, the secular government now, is going to take him to the governor of the area. The, command, the police commander is like, this is above my pay grade, and I'm not going down for what happens to Paul. I'm going to take him to the governor. I'm going to let him decide. So that's where we pick up next week. So Paul, in chains, is told by Jesus, encouragement, Jesus appears, but he says, you know what? As you just did here, you spoke the truth. You spoke the truth. You told them about me. You spoke the truth. You did the true right thing. Now you've got to do that in Rome. Now, how intimidating was that? You remember the movie Gladiator, maybe? Or you remember the Roman Colosseum? <laughs> like, the Romans weren't content to just go beat somebody with rocks, right? That's not entertaining enough. If, if Paul goes to Rome and they're not happy with this message of Jesus being the Messiah and turn to, to God and, you know, love your neighbor, this thing, if they're not happy with that, then what they'll do is they'll execute him in, like, maybe the Colosseum, and, and make him a gladiator or something where he's going to get sliced and diced, and you know it was stacked against you. You know you were going to get killed like that. And 5,000, 10,000, 7,000 people were going to be all excited about it, or you're going to be fed to the lions and tigers and bears, oh my, right? I mean, they made execution fun for the masses. Jesus appears to Paul and says, as you just testified, as you spoke the truth now in Jerusalem, and it was scary, you got to do the same only this time in Rome. But for Paul, he was so convinced that Jesus was raised from the dead that he's like, game on, okay. I'm your man. I'll do it. 
because he knew the death that Jesus had suffered. And he knew that Jesus was raised from the dead. He was okay. And somehow that gave Paul then the courage to say, all right, if God the Father is with me as he was with Jesus in that way, I can do it. I can speak it. I can testify. I will face down lions and tigers, bears, gladiators. It does not matter. I will have courage and I will speak the truth no matter the fire. That's what he did. For us then, pretty easy a message then, right? Easy to figure out. God wants you to speak the truth and to do the truth. And he may put something on your heart to say to a family member or to, to somehow forgive somebody or somehow to confront somebody or somehow to take a stand in your company or somehow to, to, to write a letter or somehow to, to maybe do something that's just a little, little more scary than you'd like to do or a little more intimidating or you realize, well, if I do that, others might reject me or might not like what I'm saying. And, and God may say, look, I will give you the strength, but you've got to do this. You've got to speak the truth you, in love. You've got to communicate it. You've got to do it. Have courage again and again and again. When God encounters somebody, whether it's through an angel or directly through a voice, he'll say, fear not, I'm with you. Or he'll say, have courage, take courage, be courageous. Will you do that, yes or no? Okay.